the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James Agenese, and today we're looking at Barbarian, released in 2022. Barbarian follows Tess, a young woman who finds a guy already staying at the Airbnb she's booked. And that's pretty much all I want to say about the plot. I know I say this for a lot of movies, but Barbarian is one of those that you should watch without any prior knowledge. It has a unique structure that's unpredictable for first-time viewers, and the less you know about it, the better. Seriously, go watch it. It's on Hulu. I guarantee you won't see what's coming. That unpredictability is thanks to writer-director Zach Kreger, who joins a growing list of comedians turned horror movie makers. Kreger is one of the three founding members of the comedy group The Whitest Kids You Know, alongside Sam Brown and the late Trevor Moore. Rest in peace. Kreger wrote Barbarian without an outline, reasoning that in order to surprise the audience, he had to surprise himself. The result is a film that takes a couple of risky hard turns, but always manages to find its way home in the end. Barbarian is equal parts hilarious and suspenseful. It's also a thrilling crowd pleaser with a ton to say about gender dynamics. I love it when a movie can pull that kind of thing off. It explores a whole spectrum of sexism in various forms and degrees that women have to put up with. And that theme is worked in so intelligently, informing the way these characters behave and interact. For bonus points, it takes place in Detroit, which is always gonna get me extra interested. How many guests will get checked out of this scare b and Let's find out and get to the kilograms. Uh, sorry. Let's find out and get to the kobasa. What the f Why can't I say let's find out and get to the Kilimanjaro? Alright, sorry. I, I think I need the help of the weird kill counter. So, it seems like you're in a rut. A rut? A rut. It, it's what's zapping your kill count spark. But, luckily I can help with today's sponsor, Scentbird. Oh, but Zorn, I, I already- ah, 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 ah. Come here. Tell me, what is your favorite fragrance note? Oh, that's pretty easy, it's, it's sandalwood. It reminds me of the comforting smell of incense filling my home as a kid. But Zorn, I already use Scentbird. I mean, making sure I smell good is an important part of my daily routine. You do, but, uh, oh, uh, <laughs> Uh, ooh. Just one second. Ah, how do you use it? Well, I, I make sure to stay stocked up on my Michael Kors Sexy Amber. I really enjoy its spiced sandalwood and its floral infused aroma. Plus, with the convenient carrying case, I'm easily able to have it on hand wherever I go. Aha! Rut! You are only using one fragrance, where Scentbird makes it super easy to discover a new fragrance every month for just $17 for a 30-day supply. But luckily, I can help. Here, try these. Mmm, woodsy. Yes, that's the Perfumer Story Sequoia Wood, which is layered around the richness of red sequoia wood. Now. Try this Dusk by Brown Girl Jane. Okay. Oh, I like that. Good notes of almond and vanilla. <laughs> of course you do. It's got hints of sandalwood. <gasps> you see, having a go-to scent is great, but you could always get a full-size version of Sexy Amber alongside your monthly vial. That way you can try something new and have your tried and true. Thanks, man. All right, I, I think I'm ready to get back to counting kills. I'm taking these with me. <laughs> Come on, Molly. <sighs> A dog's gonna try and take my job. Get out of your own scent rut with coupon code MEAT55OFF for 55% off at Scentbird. That's just over $7 for your first month. Available in the US and Canada. All right, sorry about that. How many guests will get checked out of the scare B&B? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins on a dark and stormy night with lightning that friggin' howls. Damn, it's loud and chanty out here. Can we get into that car, please? Thank you, much better. Tess Marshall just got to her Airbnb on Barbary Street in Detroit the night before a job interview. Only problem is she's locked out. Oh, wait, no, there's another problem. The lights are on and somebody's home. His name is Keith and he says he's booked the same house on a different app. With nowhere else to go, Tess steps out of the storm and into a tunnel car. Even though it looks like he's been sleeping and he's more packed for hygiene than slaughter, Tess can't help but be wary of her present company. Fair enough, since Keith kind of steps in it at first. Would you mind pulling up your reservation confirmation just so I can see it. 
In case I'm some kind of weirdo who's broken in here to sleep? I mean, yes, literally exactly that. Keith is played by Bill Skarsgård, last seen on the kill count eating kids meals in It Chapters 1 and 2. Writer-director Zach Kreger counted on that previous role, and Skarsgård's unique appearance to influence the audience's opinion of Keith. He's attractive and repulsive simultaneously. <laughs> Meanwhile, Tess is played by English actress Georgina Campbell, who starred in Bird Box Barcelona earlier this year. Did anyone check that thing out? Cause y'all wouldn't shut the fuck up about that first one. With a medical convention in town, hotel rooms are scarce, so Keith offers to let Tess spend the night. To put her more at ease, he offers the bedroom, which she can lock. This gentleman won't let a quote young lady sleep on the couch. Blame it on my upbringing, but it's not up for discussion. Keith's urbane tendencies also leads him to brewing that young lady some tea, but she's seen get out and opts not to drink the hot brown garbage water. Just like with Fresh from the same year, the horror in Barbarian is rooted in the uncertainty faced by women around male strangers. Kreger was inspired after reading the self-help book, The Gift of Fear. It details subtle things women should look out for, like men touching their property without permission. It was really eye-opening for me because I realized that as a man, I don't have to think about this ever. He set out to write a scenario with as many red flags as possible, giving us an opening sequence that's wonderfully suspenseful. Tess never knows whether or not to trust Keith, since the character's behavior perfectly toes the line between awkward and threatening. I got it. No, 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 no. Sure? no. I can. You sure? Yeah. Okay. While Tess is doing laundry, Keith offers up some wine, but makes a point of opening it in front of her. But I didn't want to open it before um, you got out of the shower because I, I know so you didn't drink your tea. And, would, well, I totally get that, by the way. I mean, you don't know me, and, and this is a fucking really weird situation. I think Keith's a great character, who's probably like a lot of awkward guys trying to navigate modern gender dynamics. Sometimes he tries so hard to not make Tess uncomfortable, it ends up coming off as weird. Tess is wary about the whole situation, and smartly takes as many precautions as possible, like locking every door behind her and making sure this guy is who he says he is. She starts to open up when Keith recognizes the documentary filmmaker she's interviewing with tomorrow. She made a movie about jazz last year called Blue Easy. Oh, I saw that. Turns out the two have common ground, since Keith's the co-founder of a local artist collective looking for new parts of the city to work out of. Maybe these two will be a match on pairing day. With ice broken, they talk long after the laundry cycle ends. Tess lets her guard down enough to wind herself up. Cabernet party on! They make sure to talk about the movie's themes. And the world's different for you. Guys get to blast that way through life, making messes. Girls have to be careful. And make cheeky references to a certain evil clown. Do I look like some kind of monster? Amidst all the talking, they get a little flirty and even end up fooling around in the sheets. Now, don't be crass. I meant Keith shows her how to tie a duvet and or make a scary ghost costume. Ooh! It's a fun night. And while Keith hangs around a bit too long at the end, maybe to see if anything might happen next, he gracefully leaves the room when the opportunity doesn't arise. Okay, well, there's a couch that needs to be. Yeah. The first 20 minutes of Barbarian are just these two characters meeting and feeling each other out. And it's absolutely awesome, thanks to Campbell and Skarsgård and Kreger's writing of realistic social situations. Keith disappears the next morning, perhaps to return to Hemlock Grove, but he makes sure to leave a note behind to confirm their chemistry. Oh, look at that smile. She's smitten. And that's why you always leave a note. Tess leaves for her interview and gets her first good look at the surrounding neighborhood. It's, uh, it's, it's not good. While Barbarian takes place in the Detroit neighborhood of Brightmoor, this house and the block it resides on was constructed in Sofia, Bulgaria, where most of the movie was filmed. They built 13 house facades in a field that was mostly empty, minus a laboratory that you can actually see in between the houses across the street. I do take a little bit of issue with how the movie is set in Detroit, but mostly filmed overseas. But to be fair, they do use B-roll filmed in Brightmoor itself, so there is some truth to their depiction. This driving footage was captured during the two days they shot in Detroit, along with the stuff downtown where Tess goes for her job interview. She crushes the interview, though her rental house location raises a red flag. No, you shouldn't be there. As if to underline the warning, when she gets back, a homeless man charges at her, yelling for her to go on and get. Come out that house! Go away! Come out that house! The cops aren't available to help, which makes Tess so mad she could shit. Damn it, Keith, bad roommate move. Tess finds some TP in the creepy ass Michigan basement, but gets locked down there by a mischievous door that closes on its own. And she can't call for help either. Aw, oh, Tess, why'd you leave her phone up on the table? You wanted to! Seemingly trapped, she sees something behind that toy duck from Nightmare Before Christmas. It's a rope in the wall, and some tug of war reveals a secret passageway. Wanna check out that void, Tess? Nope. That joke was a little bit stepped on by Jordan Peele's movie that came out earlier the same year. Kreger actually asked Peel if he would have a similar joke in his movie, but Peel assured him that it would all be okay. And then when I watched Nope, there is a very strong yeah. Nope moment. And I was like, well, God damn it, dude. But I.
I like our moment, so I wouldn't have taken it out anyway, so it's all good. After a while, Tess gets bored enough to Brendan Fraser mummy some light down the passage with a mirror. Behind another door, she discovers a nightmare of a spooky spare bedroom. Ah, you don't want to see a camera pointed at a bed like that. And is that a is that a poop bucket? Oh man. Eventually Keith returns and lets Tess out of the basement. She wants to leave, but while Keith's concerned for her, he won't take her worries at face value. I think this stems from his chivalrous attitude towards women. He even physically prevents her from leaving as he tries to calm her down. It's not a malicious sexism. Like, he's a nice guy and means well, but he's got an old-fashioned sense of thinking he knows what's best for her. You really didn't have to do that. Not even. Up for discussion. He explains his point of view, which is valid until he gets a bit condescending. I just, I didn't see it, okay? And I can't just be running off in a panic because there's a room downstairs with a bed and a bucket. His need to see it for himself, rather than take her word for it, leads him into the basement. Tess waits for him to come back, but he never does. When she goes to check on him, propping the basement door open this time, she discovers there's an even deeper and darker basement. Ha! Fucking house of leaves, y'all! Tess is so ready to go home at this point, but she hears Keith screaming for help from below. Against her better judgment, she goes down to look for him, discovering a DIY dog pound in the process. Fantastic panic acting from Georgina Campbell here. Keith! <laughs> Answer me, Keith! Tess is jump scared by Keith crawling like a creeper. He tells her someone else is in the basement. I'm not going back there. And that someone else bashes Keith's head to bits against the wall. <sighs> Should have kept your scars guard up, dude. His killer is a... <sighs> giant naked lady, and after killing him, she screams in Tess's face. As much as I love Bill Skarsgård as Keith, his death is worth it to have this awesome fake out. He was all over the trailers, so it's a genuine shock when this busty beast kills him 42 minutes in. It's a death so shocking, the movie gets knocked into a new protagonist. Ricky Tikki Tavi plays us into sunny Los Angeles, where actor AJ Gilbride is cruising down the Pacific Coast Highway. AJ is played by Justin Long, whose horror credits include Drag Me to Hell, Tusk, and Jeepers Creepers. AJ hops on a conference call with a couple of producers, one of whom is voiced by Long's real-life wife, Kate Bosworth. AJ's TV pilot has just been picked up, but his joyride's about to end courtesy of an accusation from his co-star. Apparently Megan Maddox has contacted the network through her lawyer, and she's made a very serious accusation against you. She's saying that you raped her. AJ swears it isn't true, but things fall apart for him quickly anyway. The trades publish a story so scathing, even his financial manager drops him. AJ wants to counter sue for defamation, but that'll cost some cash. Thankfully, he owns a couple of houses in Detroit. Oh, that's how he's connected. Okay. He books a flight to DT Dub so he can start selling the properties, which of course includes the rental that was double booked by Keith and Tess. Turns out that wasn't nefarious or anything. It was just incompetent management. AJ's not happy when he finds their stuff still there. It's enough for a double what the fuck. The fuck? The fuck, dude? AJ starts to show his ass when he answers a call from his friend with a gay slur. He goes out for drinks with that friend, played by director Zach Greger in a cameo, and gets tipsy enough to tip his hand and confirm for all of us that he's a guilty sleazebag. We fucked. We did fuck, okay? Right? She just took some convincing is all. It's not left ambiguous either, despite his own feelings towards the situation. Did she say no? Was I she mean, like, no stop? at first, but like, I wasn't like, come here, bitch, I'm gonna rape you. He wakes up the next morning with a Me Too migraine, which he takes out on Tessa's personal belongings. He hears a bump in the basement, so he arms himself with a flashlight and a paring knife. All right, bitch. Get ready to get fucked. Downstairs, he discovers the secret passage and hidden room, but AJ's chief concern is what it might mean for his wallet. Can underground rooms be listed in square? Footage. It's a hilarious contrast to Tess's reaction, and reinforces what she said earlier about men living lives of innate confidence. The world's different for you. Guys get to blast that way through life, making messes. Girls have to be careful. I mean, the dude's literally walking backwards into a dark space that Tess was cautious to enter. He doesn't even get goosebumps when he finds out his basement has a basement. This dungeon is just more square footage he can add. Yo, yo! Anyone here? Alvin? Simon? Theodore? After measuring around the human-sized cages, AJ discovers a room with diaper decor and a lo-fi home nursing video. The voice on the video is Sarah Paxton, Zach Kreger's wife and star of Last House on the Left and Return to Halloween Town. Those are two very different movies. We also briefly heard Paxton as Megan, the co-star AJ raped, when he left her an ill-advised drunken voice message earlier. Hi, this is Megan. Please leave a message. All of a sudden, something starts eating up his tape measure like it were fruit by the foot. It makes everything wide-angled, including this GoPro-looking first-person shot. And AJ ends up fleeing down the corridor from a ferocious feral female. She chases him until he trips and falls into an underground prison, where his new cellmate asks him to mind the noise, please. 
One of Barbarian's biggest strengths is its cinematography by Zach Cooperstein. He and Kreger filmed the movie's very different locations, using very different styles. Upstairs, they were inspired by David Fincher's slow-paced intensity in Seven and Mindhunter, with subtle camera movements that are motivated by what the characters are doing. You're not necessarily aware of the camera, right? Conversely, Downstairs sees a much more active style, inspired by Sam Raimi's work in The Evil Dead and Drag Me to Hell. The camera movements are wild and crazy, with the shots often canted or unnaturally wide. It's an excellent way for the style to match the substance of the script, intentionally distorting the audience with surprises. True to that point, after Tessa's shush, the movie smash cuts into a flashback, throwing us for a loop a second time. This is the early 80s, when Brightmoor was more bright, still in its Stepford Prime. The future rental house is a original owner, Frank, is going shopping for a home birth. You've got a midwife, right? She should have given you a list. It's just me. Sounds like he's trying to create his own demon fleet on Barbary Street. Frank is played by Richard Brake, a four-time Kill Count vet and one-time Night King. In the parking lot, he goes housewife hunting, stalking one woman all the way home with a match cut. Disguised as a maintenance worker, don't want to know where he got that Carlos jumpsuit, he casually gains access to her home. DWP, ma'am. Sorry to bother. No bother. Fucking DWP. The ruse allows him to leave one of her windows unlocked for future evil doings. He returns home, where he tends to some commotion in the basement. <laughs> I'm sure that's just the house settling. Obviously, Detroit is a big part of this movie, and since I grew up next to the city, I have a certain defensiveness about it. Barbarian joins It Follows and Don't Breathe as great horror movies that take place in or around the city. Yet, all three rely on D-Town's decrepit blocks and danger to tell their story. Plus, Don't Breathe and Barbarian were mostly shot elsewhere. Again, I love all three of these movies, and for the most part, I think they handle the city's condition more or less okay. Barbarian wins points for this scene with Frank's neighbor Doug, played by comedian Kurt Braunler. He says he's leaving. The neighborhood's going to hell, Frank. This would be the tail end of the so-called white flight that really took off after the 1967 Detroit riot. By including this scene, Barbarian is showing how that practice led to these conditions. It emptied out the city and took away its tax base, giving Frank's evil a place to fester. It's at least saying something. But still, I would love a Detroit set horror movie that doesn't only focus on its worst parts. There are plenty of cool and perfectly safe places in the D. Let's start seeing those, come on! Back in the present, Tess tries to catch AJ up on their situation. This is very, very important. You need to stay calm. You cannot freak out around her. Their captor, called the mother, returns with mandatory mama milk. Tess takes her medicine, but AJ can't stomach it. Probably all those hairs on the nipple. So mother hops down and drags him into a new kind of hell. He's gonna get some extra coddling. That's for his own good. The mother's imposing stature comes courtesy of six foot eight actor Matthew Patrick Davis, who's actually quite the handsome fella and really nice. At the end of these scenes where he's like, ah, he goes, sir. Are you okay? Sorry. <laughs> it's very good. How you doing? Davis chemically shaved his whole body for the role, save for his eyebrows, which he refused to get rid of. It initially took five hours to apply all the mother prosthetics to him, but the makeup team got it down to two by the end of production. They consisted of face, boobs, and crotch pieces. They had a fake butt at first, too, but it looked kind of dumb, so Davis had to film with his actual bare ass out. It was weird walking around naked, but I got, got used to it, and it was strange. We all got used to it. <laughs> The makeup and performance are good, but man, I am so tired of tall, naked ladies as horror monsters. It's gotten out of hand at this point. AJ is taken to the diaper room, and in a nauseating scene, forcibly breastfed by the mother. It could have been worse, too. In a deleted scene, the mother kills a rat and baby birds it into AJ's mouth. Oh my god. Ugh. Tess takes the opportunity to escape her obliette, but she runs into AJ's tape measure on the way out, alerting the mother. The basement door is locked again, so Tess busts her way out through the basement window. She narrowly escapes her helicopter mom with the help of Andre, that homeless man who chased her into the house earlier. As you might have guessed, Andre was actually trying to warn her about the mother. Probably would have worked better if he hadn't run towards her screaming, little girl. Hey, little girl! Hey, little girl! You can't trust guys who say that. Little girl. It even makes the Beatles sound threatening. You better run for your life if you can. Tess wants to go back inside to save AJ, but Andre tells her to get safe before nightfall, since Mother leaves the house to hunt in the after hours. With Mother distracted, AJ manages to sneak further into the tunnel system. He discovers a nasty man cave, as well as a nasty man. It's Frank, all old and musty now. Just, uh, Grandpa joe it up in the corner. AJ initially tries to help him, giving Frank the benefit of the doubt that this old dude living down here is somehow on the up and up. But then he finds Frank's private collection of videotapes. Oh man, these labels are sick. One of them is won't stop crying. Dear God! AJ witnesses the tape's monstrous contents, which we the audience are thankfully spared. What is wrong with you? 
the fuck is wrong with you? Rather than answering, Frank pulls out a gun and avoids any accountability for his actions. Yeah, after that, you might as well arm yourself there, AJ. As we discussed in our podcast episode on this movie, the three male characters represent different forms of sexism. Keith, on a high horse of chivalry, is the most well-meaning and least dangerous. AJ sees himself as a good guy, but in actuality is a fratty date rapist. And Frank is the most extreme, a monstrous kidnapper and violent rapist, the exact kind of person Keith and AJ say they aren't. What? What? Do I look like some kind of monster? I wasn't like, come here, bitch, I'm gonna rape you. But Tess has no idea where each of these guys falls on the spectrum, so she has to play it cautiously. At this point, she probably blames that caution for Keith's death, making her determined to save a guy she doesn't know, who is everything she was worried Keith would be. Tess flags down a couple of horror movie cops, who assume from her appearance that she's on drugs. Ma'am. There's no one in this building, no one's being murdered, and the only crime that I've seen so far is you breaking this window. <sighs> Just more dudes not listening to this poor woman. They leave her, so Tess breaks another window to get her keys back. But since it's dark now, the mother's roaming range has increased. Tess pins the mother against the house, and after some screaming and pounding, it appears to put her down for good. Tess goes back inside and into the basement to save AJ, but he's been walking around with frayed nerves and a gun. Hello? What? Yo! What the fuck, dude? Come on, AJ, have a little trigger discipline. What are you, that kid from Halloween 2018? Don't shoot! Ah! Thank God this isn't an awful ending and Tess is still alive. But things ain't great since the mother's at large again, so the two head out to find Andre in hopes that he can help. Andre brings them to his water tower hideout, where he explains that the mother is a result of Frankie's 80s escapades. He used to bring women down there, and then he started making babies with them. And babies with the babies. And you make a copy of a copy of a copy, and you end up with something like that. Hearing about the worst man imaginable gives AJ the chance to reflect on his own actions. I might be a bad person, or maybe I'm, I'm a good person who just did a bad thing. Honestly, his initial assessment here is a necessary first step to making amends. I can't change what I've done. I can just try and fix it. Maybe you can teach a guy who was an old dog's new tricks. Kreger originally wanted Zac Efron to play AJ, envisioning the character as a dim-witted beefcake. Efron turned the part down, and Kreger reworked the character for Justin Long, who he thought worked out better since he's usually known for playing nice guys. Justin Long is is such a warm and a disarming and a charming, like lovable presence mm -hmm. on screen. Right. And I was like, that is so much more engaging to me uh, to have someone with that sort of palette playing a vile character, that's interesting. Long does a great job adding layers of humanity to this shitty shallot of a man. Andre says they should be safe as long as they stay here until morning. I've been living in this place more than 15 years, and she ain't never came in this motherfucker. Oh shit! The mother jacks him up and jaxes him up, ripping his arm off and beating him to death with it. Eat your heart out, Goro. AJ immediately abandons Tess, showing he hasn't changed his self-serving ways. The two make it up the water tower, which was actually filmed on a set. And instead of using a digital background, they hung up black fabric and poked holes in it for lights to shine through to simulate a distant city. I thought that was pretty cool. AJ earns his place in the idiocracy by fumbling his firearm. With nowhere left to run, he decides to save his own skin once and for all. I can get away, but you're gonna have to slow her down. This motherfucker would rather live free than die hard, and throws Tess off of the tower. Instead of attacking him, the mother Olympic dives off the side after her. AJ retrieves his gun and checks their bodies. Somehow, the mother has wound up beneath Tess, presumably to cushion her fall. But, uh, not sure how that would have worked with, like, science, you know? When AJ sees that Tess is still alive, he makes, like, an HR department and tries to cover his ass. I didn't even let go! You started to slip! Guy dodges accountability better than he dodges wrenches. The mother's still alive too, though, and she don't approve of gaslighting. She grabs him by the throat and makes like Mother Mountain by turning AJ's eyeballs into banana mush! Oh, and then she banana splits his head in half! Fuck yeah! The mother tries to put an end to her baby's day out, but Tessa's in no state for a piggyback ride home. She grabs the gun and has a brief moment of sympathy for her cave-dwelling captor. <laughs> But she ain't going back to that basement, so she makes like a mice and mother and shoots this Frankenstein back. The movie ends with Tess walking through the end credits as the Ronettes Be My Baby plays. Tess will politely decline. How many people met their end at the hands of a smother mother? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, oh, what are we doing? We're, is this for tax purposes? Okay. Oop. Hey. Yeah! Five people died in Barbarian. The victims consisted of four men and one woman, giving us this blueberry and pie chart. This count and gender breakdown has been seen five times before on this show. 
Ooh, including demonic toys. That's a good one. With a runtime of 102 minutes, Barbarian left us with a kill on average every 20.4 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to AJ. You spend the whole movie rooting for this guy's comeuppance, and boy does that uppance sure come. The almost shady for lamest kill will go to Frank, who took the easy way out of a mess he created. And that's it. Barbarian was released in 2022 to well-earned critical acclaim. I can't wait to see what Gregor does next. Next week is a big one, because we're covering Saw X, or Saw 10, whatever you want to call it. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count for Barbarian. This was such a fun watch in theaters without any idea of what was going to happen. It's rare to see a movie where you really can't predict what happens next. So major props for making this fresh feeling unpredictable horror film. Good job, Zach. I want to thank some patrons like Tracy Iroy, Sarah Hanzelik, Dennis Ramirez, Stacey Thompson, The Reverend Leopard, Slug, or maybe is it The Reverend Leopard Slug? I don't know. Cosmic 497, Jericho Edwards, and John Thrasher Thiel. Thanks everyone. Be good people.